Hi, my name is Mike Murphy, and I'm going to give a summary of a talk that I presented at the Biochemical Society Redox Regulation Health and Disease meeting in March in Edinburgh in 2014. Now, I work at the Mitochondrial Biology Unit run by the MRC in Cambridge, and I work on aspects of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species in redox signaling and pathology, so that's the title of my talk. And what I wanted to do was to give an overview of how reactive oxygen species produced by mitochondria can contribute to pathology and to redox signaling. So, in the next slide, what you can see is an overview of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species metabolism. The respiratory chain produces reactive oxygen species, and then these reactive oxygen species can potentially go on to cause damage to mitochondria, either by producing radicals that damage the lipids, the DNA, or the protein. And these together can induce cell damaging activities such as induction of the permeability transition pore, the PTP, which can induce cell death. Now, all of these different aspects of mitochondrial ROS are known to contribute to pathologies such as ischemia perfusion injury and heart attack, or chronic disorders such as neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, or things like type 2 diabetes. However, the model that this is just general damage to the mitochondria that leads to cell death has to be expanded a bit because we also think that the ROS production by the respiratory chain, particularly hydrogen peroxide, can also go out of the mitochondria and act as a redox signal. So some of the pathology may actually be because the signaling is disrupted. So we have two aspects of mitochondrial ROS in pathology. One, you generally cause damage to the mitochondria that leads to cell death. Secondly, what can happen is that you can have the redox signals which can come out and if these are disrupted, there's too much or too little of a redox signal, that might cause chronic disruption to cell signaling pathways. So to explore these, one critical aspect is we need to be able to measure the levels of reactive oxygen species inside experimental animals or inside patients because the situations in ex vivo samples such as isolated mitochondrial cells are not directly comparable to what happens inside of the body of an animal or a person. To do this, we've developed methods of targeting probes into mitochondria, and the next slide shows some of that work. What we can do is we can target probes, indicated by X here, by conjugating them or linking them to lipophilic cations. And the lipophilic cation we choose to use most often is the triphenylphosphonium. You can see here the phosphorus atom with three benzene rings around it. That is the property of getting dragged into cells and into mitochondria because of the positive charge. Then inside the mitochondria it accumulates in the mitochondria within the body and there it will be at a far higher concentration, maybe a thousand fold higher inside the mitochondria than elsewhere in the cell. This means that if we attach a probe to the phosphonium then we'll have that probe localized in mitochondria in vivo. Then if the probe can react with reactive oxygen species to produce what we call an exomarker, something that indicates what the local concentration was, then we can assess those later on and infer what the levels of the reactive species were inside the experimental animal and thereby figure out what the contribution of reactive oxygen species was to pathology or to a particular redox signaling pathway. So in this slide we can show one type of probe that we have used called Mito B. This is a mitochondria targeted probe which is designed to react with hydrogen peroxide. What happens is you can administer that to an experimental animal such as a Drosophila or a fruit fly or a mouse by injection, then it will get sucked into the cells by the plasma membrane potential, then further accumulated by mitochondria by the mitochondrial membrane potential. And this huge accumulation of mito B inside the mitochondria means that it's effectively only present in mitochondria in the body as far as we can tell. Then the mito B gets slowly converted to mito P by a chemical reaction between part of the mito B molecule with hydrogen peroxide. And this is a direct reaction, it doesn't require an enzyme or anything like that, and it's relatively slow. So over time, the mito B will be gradually converted to mito P. Now, of course, both will be excreted from the animal over time. So even over several hours, the amounts of mito B and mito P will decrease quite considerably. However, the ratio will increase over time because both are excreted at the same rate. So as you can see in the lower section of the slide, the greater the ratio of mito P to mito B indicates the greater amount of hydrogen peroxide that's present inside the mitochondria in the free-living animal. Bear in mind that the mito B would be injected, then we could leave the mouse or the fly to move around for several hours. So we're integrating the average hydrogen peroxide inside the mitochondria in the animal over that period of time. Now one example where we use this is shown in the next slide. What we can see in this slide is that we injected mito B into fruit flies at different ages either young, 7-day-old, middle-aged, 28-days-old, or old, 56-day-old flies. What happens is that, as you can see from the curve on the left, that after 50 to 60 days they're starting to die off. This is their normal lifespan. 
We wanted to see, was there an increase in mitochondrial ROS production in these flies as they get old? This was because the mitochondrial oxidative stress theory of aging implied that there should be an increase in oxidative stress with age as flies get older, and it may be in general for all animals as they get older. So what you can see here on the right-hand side is that when we measure the mito P to mito V ratio, in other words, when we measure mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide in these free-living flies over several hours at different ages, there is an increase in the level of hydrogen peroxide, both for the males and the females. That's very interesting, and it's the first time we've been able to demonstrate that there is an increase in hydrogen peroxide in an organism as it gets older, and also this is in a free-living organism as it's doing its normal stuff. However, further work showed that this hydrogen peroxide seems to be a consequence of aging. It doesn't seem to be a cause of aging. We could infer this because when we intervene in the flies to alter things such as the amounts of food they eat, which alters their lifespan, that does not change the levels of hydrogen peroxide, even though it does change the lifespan. So from this, our current view seems to be that while there is an increase in hydrogen peroxide with aging, it seems to be probably a consequence of aging rather than a cause of aging. Now, in addition to actually using these targeting procedures to measure the ROS levels in mitochondria, we can also target molecules with therapeutic potential to mitochondria to actually decrease ROS production. In the next slide, we're looking at one of these examples called mitosnow. This is the same targeting moiety, and it's attached to a nitric oxide-containing molecule that can get sucked into mitochondria. And once inside mitochondria, it can transfer the nitric oxide onto protein thiols, which is called protein S-nitrosation or S-nitrosylation. The reason for doing this was that in heart attacks, there was a lot of evidence that if you could increase the amount of S-nitrosation or S-nitrosylation of mitochondrial proteins during or prior to a heart attack, then that would actually decrease the amount of damage. Now, bear in mind that in a heart attack, what happens is that the blood flow to the heart decreases for about, say, 30-40 minutes as your blood vessel is blocked by, say, a blood clot. Then what happens typically in a hospital is we remove that blood clot, for example, by putting in a catheter and a stent into the coronary artery, then the blood flows back into the heart. However, when that blood hits the tissue that has been blocked off for 30 minutes, what's called ischemic tissue, this reperfusion of the ischemic tissue produces a burst of reactive oxygen species from the mitochondria, and that underlies a lot of the damage. So it's kind of a catch-22. We have to restore blood to the ischemic heart, but in doing so, we produce a burst of damage. Now, the idea was that we could add mitosnow during this reperfusion phase by injecting it into the patient, hopefully, upon reperfusion and thereby damp down this burst of ROS upon reperfusion. So what we found was that when we inject mitosnow into a mouse model of a heart attack, we did get extensive protection against this burst of ROS, and we were able to show how that was occurring. So this is the mechanism that we were able to derive when we injected mitosnow into mice that were undergoing a heart attack. What we found was that the critical complex in mitochondria that produces ROS is complex 1. That's not necessarily unexpected because complex 1 is thought to be the major source of reactive oxygen species in mitochondria in vivo. What seems to happen is that complex 1 on the top left corner of this slide is in the active form. It's taking electrons from NADH and passing them onto CoQ, labeled by Q here. Under ischemic conditions, when the heart is blocked by a blood clot in a blood vessel, Complex 1 seems to undergo this deactive transition, which was first discovered by Vinogradov in Russia. And it shows here that the complex undergoes this conformational change. What's interesting is under these conditions, a particular cysteine residue on the ND3 subunit of complex 1 is altered so that the cysteine 39 is now exposed, as you can see in the bottom section of the slide. Now, normally what happens upon reperfusion is that the complex one rapidly reactivates and produces a burst of ROS damage, and this, we think, underlies a lot of the ischemic reperfusion injury that damages the heart during a heart attack. However, if we inject mitosnow upon reperfusion, it can transfer the nitric oxide onto this cysteine, the cysteine 39 of the ND3 subunit of complex one, and that S-nitrosation then slows down the reactivation of complex 1 and prevents it from producing a burst of ROS. Importantly, this modification is reversed by glutathione and thyroidox inside mitochondria. So all it does is it slows down the reactivation by maybe 5 or 10 minutes, but that's sufficient for the heart to recover and the metabolites to be cleared away, so that by that stage, mitochondria can go back to working normally without producing any burst of ROS. And so this approach is something that we're hoping to test in further animal models and hopefully move on to be used as a treatment for heart attack at some stage in the future.